I don't have any uh, specific announcements to make, but I can, uh, I, as you know, the President met with uh, Speaker of the House John Boehner here earlier. Uh, they had a good and constructive meeting of about an hour uh, where they discussed a range of issues. Uh, you also saw, I think, a uh, readout of a conversation the President had earlier with President Karzai of Afghanistan, uh, which uh, I don't have a duration on that call, uh, but it was a fairly substantive call as described in the readout. Uh, beyond that, I have no other announcements, so I'll go to Jim Cunin. Uh, thanks, Jay. So I, I wanted to ask you about those those two conversations on on uh, with with Karzai. It, it, he hasn't spoken to him since June, I believe. Should we read some kind of significance to the call coming at this particular time? And given that the the discussion centered a little bit on uh, giving some space for signing a B BSA after the elections, mm -hmm. is there a tipping point? where it becomes impossible to make any kind of commitment about, uh, about U.S. troops in, on the ground? On the first part of your question, the answer is yes. Uh, the President called President Karzai today in order to discuss uh, preparations for Afghanistan's upcoming elections, uh, the Afghan-led peace and reconciliation efforts, and specifically the bilateral security agreement. And as you know, uh, we have been calling on the Afghan government to complete that process, uh, to sign that agreement, which was negotiated in good faith, uh, and to do so promptly. Um, President Obama told President Karzai that because he has demonstrated, he being President Karzai, that it is unlikely that he will sign the BSA, the United States is moving forward with additional contingency planning. So in terms of the timing of the call, I think you can look at it in that context. Uh, when it comes to the potential for a post-2014 troop presence, uh, two things are happening. One, as we made clear would be the case, the President has uh, tasked the Pentagon with uh, preparing for the contingency that there will be no troops in Afghanistan beyond 2014. Uh, but we are also uh, remaining open to the possibility of a post-2014 uh, troop presence should a bilateral security agreement be signed or the bilateral security agreement be signed uh, later in the year. But the longer we go without a BSA, and we've been making this clear, uh, the more challenging it will be to plan and to execute any U.S. mission. Furthermore, the longer we go without a signed BSA, the more likely it will be uh, that any post-2014 U.S. mission will be smaller in scale and, amb and ambition. So I don't have a, a specific point uh, to identify for you, to, except to say that the further we go without a signed BSA, any contemplated post-2014 uh, mission would be necessarily limited in scale and ambition because uh, of the requirements of planning for that troop presence. Did the President provide any kind of time frame for, to Karzai as to when? He provided the time frame I just read out but to you, which is? Any a specific time, when, you know, by the need something by the spring, need something by the fall, need something, and that would result in I, I, I think, difference? or I know, that the President was very explicit about what we've just read out, which is that the fact that President Karzai has indicated that it is unlikely he will sign the BSA means that uh, if if he doesn't sign it, it is uh, at least possible that a, a successor Afghan government might sign it, but that pushes us later into the year. And the longer we go without a signed BS BSA, the uh, by necessity, the uh, more narrow in size and ambition the mission for a post-2014 force would be. Uh, so this is about essentially planning for a post-2014 mission, and there are a lot of uh, complexities involved in uh, asking the Defense Department to uh, plan for a zero option, that is a full withdrawal in keeping with the President's promise to end the war in Afghanistan uh, by the end of 2014, uh, and he will keep that promise, and then also to uh, envision uh, and plan for a contingency of a post-2014 uh, smaller troop presence, uh, and what they're in the President's view, uh, 
it is uh, necessary to plan for that force uh, against the clock here in the sense that the longer we go without a BSA, the, the, uh, the smaller in scale and ambition the mission would have to be. In the conversation with the speaker, it's been since December of 2012 that they had a face-to-face -face alone session. Why has it taken so long? I mean, this is the leader of the congressional opposition, and he's the President of the United States. Well, I, I'd say a couple of things, that? Jim. I, uh, the uh, President has conversations with leaders of Congress, and not all of which uh, are read out to the press. One. Two, uh, today's meeting was good and constructive. It covered a range of issues. Uh, and uh, it was, as in the President's view, a useful conversation. Three, uh, I think you recall the Speaker of the House uh, as reported, having said that he would not ever negotiate with the President of the United States again. So uh, the point is that our, the President's position on these issues and his communication with Congress I think has been robust. Uh, and uh, we're looking for ways to move an agenda forward that expands opportunity and rewards hard work and responsibility for the American people. We are looking for uh, a partner in Congress to advance part of that agenda, but the President won't stand still uh, just because Congress is standing still if Congress decides or if Republicans decide not to take action. So that's been our explicit approach uh, this year, and, and that's the approach the President has been taking thus far and will take for the rest of the year. Any softening on point three that you won't negotiate with the President? Again, I think it was a good and constructive meeting. Uh, I'm not going to read out any more uh, detail beyond, you know, sort of the general topic areas that included uh, the ACA, Afghanistan, appropriations, manufacturing, trade, the drought in California, wildfire suppression, which we talked about yesterday, other issues, infrastructure and highway, highway funding. Uh, but that's just a partial list. So I think uh, the, we're talking about a range of topics that reflect uh, the things that we in Washington are working on, both uh, here uh, at the White House and in the administration, and hopefully and potentially uh, uh, in Congress as well. Jeff. Jay, um, following up on that meeting as well, the Speaker's Office mentioned that trade was one of the issues that they discussed. Speaker Boehner has said before that it's up to the President to work on getting his own party behind uh, supporting Trade Promotion Authority. Did the President make any commitments about that, or did they discuss strategy for doing that in their meeting? Uh, trade was one of the many topics that were discussed. I don't have a further readout on the conversation. I wouldn't expect a more detailed readout on the conversation. Uh, the President's views on why it is good for the American economy and good for American workers to negotiate trade agreements that uh, expand American exports uh, are well known. And he has expressed them, I have expressed them, others have expressed them. And uh, he has made clear that it uh, – that moving forward on those trade agreements is a priority for him. Uh, it is also the case that this is an ongoing conversation that we're having with uh, members of Congress in both parties. The uh, difference of opinion that uh, exists in both parties on these issues is uh, not something that uh, suddenly sprang up in 2014. These are issues that have long uh, fostered different views, and that's something we take into account. But we believe very strongly, as the President said just last week in Mexico, that uh, having agreements that expand trade, uh, and in particular when we are talking about the Pacific region, the, 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 the fastest growing emerging economies in the world, uh, opening those markets to American goods is good for the economy, and doing so in a way that protects American workers and protects the environment is good uh, for the United States and the world. So that's why we're continuing to negotiate agreements, and we will work with Congress to try to uh, bring those agreements into, uh, into effect. You referenced the Speaker's comments about not negotiating with the President, but isn't it also the President's job to build that relationship and to, to create meetings like this? Absolutely, today? and he has. Again, uh, you are under Would and you agree that a year is a long time not to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Speaker? I would simply say that we do not read out every conversation and meeting that the President has with members of Congress. 
So are you implying with that that there have been I other would simply say that we do not read out every conversation and meeting the President, the Vice President, or other senior members of the White House has with Congress. Okay, let me ask you one other uh, question. Reuters reported yesterday that Iran signed a deal um, to sell Iraq arms and ammunition worth $195 uh, million. Has Iran informed the United States about that, and does the White House have a problem with that uh, contract? We raised our concerns uh, about this matter at the highest levels uh, with the government of Iraq and reiterated that any transfer or sale of arms from Iran is in direct violation of the United Nations Security Council resolutions. The government of Iraq assured us that it would look into the matter. Today, we have seen the press release issued by the Iraqi Ministry of Defense denying that any contracts for military equipment were signed with Iran. Uh, we will follow up with the government uh, of Iraq on that matter. Jim. Uh, getting back to the uh, President's meeting with the Speaker, uh, it's been reported, and I think it's a general feeling here in Washington, that the Speaker has been standing up to conservative groups, whether it be on the budget or the debt ceiling. Uh, did the President thank the Speaker for that when they met, uh, for sticking his neck out for him? I don't have a more detailed readout for you, Jim. I can tell you that uh, the President has noted generally, as have I and others, that uh, despite the differences that exist in Washington, we have managed to move forward when it comes to the budget agreement and the regular order established by it, uh, first negotiated by Senator Murray and Chairman Ryan and then uh, uh, passed and, and, and then uh, followed through on with the funding uh, bill that was passed. Uh, that's uh, a positive development, the fact that Republicans decided not to uh, put the full faith and credit of the United States to the test again with uh, brinksmanship over the necessity of paying the bills that Congress racks up. That was a good thing. And uh, that's good for the economy. It's good for the middle class. It's not, it's not about winners and losers here in Washington. It's, uh, it's simply a fact that when the opposite approach has been taken in the past. It's done harm to the American people, harm yeah. to job creation. So those are positives. I, don't, I just don't, I don't have a, again, I'm not going to get into no, get and 20 questions about was this said and was that asked. There's we gave a pretty. hope that, well, that perhaps a, sure. a breakthrough has been made in this relationship between the President and the Speaker and that perhaps more meetings like this might take <coughs> place that could be made. I think it's a press misconception that success or failure of legislation in Congress depends on the relationship between a President and a Speaker or a President and a leader in Congress. Uh, the President's relationship with the Speaker, as the Speaker has said and the President has said, uh, is, has always been solid. And uh, the problem we've had in the past here in Washington has been often uh, the dictation that uh, has been provided by a segment of the House Republican Congress uh, over what the House of Representatives would or would not do. Uh, and that uh, hasn't necessarily been a reflection of what the speaker would hope for in a perfect world, but what he is able to get his co uh, conference to, to do. So again, and I think going back to the broader implication from Jeff's question and some of the other questions, you saw last year coming out of the 2012 elections, uh, the president and his team very aggressively engaged with Congress, including Republicans in Congress, in an effort to try to move forward on some of the issues that have divided Washington, uh, most especially the possibility of a broader budget agreement that would uh, require compromise from both sides but would move the country forward by uh, making necessary investments and reducing the deficit and debt for the long of the medium and long term. The President put forward a good faith offer that everyone on both sides recognized as uh, a compromise and we, despite all the meetings and dinners and coffees and engagements, uh, we could not get a similar counteroffer from the Republicans. So, uh, you know, we're going to continue to engage with Congress, with Republicans, in an effort to see where we can find common ground to move the ball forward for the American people. Uh, where Congress refuses to act, uh, the President's going to use every authority available to him uh, to advance an agenda that expands opportunity and rewards hard work. And I just want to get back to the President's uh, mm -hmm. call to President Karzai. Uh, it is a fact that if this bilateral security agreement is not signed, that there will be no troops. Yes, correct. By the December 31st, they'll all be gone. Absolutely. No wavering on that. Absent a BSA, there will not be any uh, U.S. troops on the ground beyond the end of the year. And, and did the President 
his instructions to the defense secretary to initiate contingency planning. That that started today. No, or had that no, already no. Been looked at What previously? we had been saying for some time now is that uh, we wanted to see the BSA signed. That it was negotiated in good faith uh, by both sides. It was endorsed by the lawyer Jurga in Afghanistan. Uh, the end of the year deadline was one that was agreed to by both sides. Uh, Afghanistan failed to. The Afghan government failed to meet that uh, deadline, and we have been pressing uh, in the or early part of this year for <coughs> President Karzai to uh, take action so that that BSA can be completed. Uh, he has indicated that he's not likely to sign the BSA, and so we have to uh, reevaluate where we are. As we've been saying since the beginning of the year, the longer we wait, the more likely uh, the possibility is that we end up with a zero option with no troops at all beyond 2014 because we cannot uh, and will not have U.S. troops on the ground without a signed BSA. And, and former Guantanamo detainee has been arrested in Britain on suspicion of uh, terror offenses in Syria. When you see these incidences pop up, does it give the White House any pause on its policy for closing Guantanamo? I, I, I have haven't seen that specific report. What I can tell you is that there's a thorough review process that uh, on every individual, every detainee who's being considered for transfer uh, that uh, takes all of these issues into account. We move around. Margaret. Um, uh, two Afghanistan questions. Did the President in his instructions to the Pentagon um, give them a timeline to provide him with a zero option? I know this has been under discussion for a while, but now he's saying, you know, do this. Tell, tell me how it would work. Um, when do you expect to get that from them, even if you don't need to use it until mm -hmm. August or September? And I also wanted to ask you, um, when the President and Speaker Boehner uh, spoke about <coughs> Afghanistan, as the readout reflects, <coughs> can you give us some kind of a sense about whether Boehner will support Obama on this BSA thing? It seems to me like uh, you see a lot of calls from Republican leadership or committee leadership, like, uh, the President really needs to get on board and get serious about the BSA. But it seems like from the White House's perspective, you guys are saying, look, we're doing this. It's the Afghan government that's not signing it. Um, do the President and the Speaker sort of get square on that, or are you still concerned that you have political undercurrents on the Republican side that are hurting you in your posture on Afghanistan? Let me take a crack at the second part there. Uh, it's inconceivable, I think, to us that leaders in Congress would allow for a U.S. troop presence without a signed bilateral security agreement in Afghanistan. It is a simple fact that the bilateral security agreement was negotiated over a prolonged period of time in good faith. The agreement was reached. It was endorsed by uh, the representatives of the Afghan people. It is not subject to renegotiation, and I'm not sure I've heard members of Congress suggest that it should be. What I think has been amply demonstrated is that we've been pressing very hard for the Karzai government to complete the process by signing the BSA, since it is now unlikely, it has been indicated that it is unlikely by President Karzai that he will sign it. Uh, the President made clear in his uh, call today that uh, we are preparing for the possibility of no troops in Afghanistan beyond the end of the year, uh, and that any — we are open to uh, the signing of a bilateral security agreement uh, later in the year, but the longer it takes to get there, uh, by necessity, because of the planning, uh, the smaller the mission will be beyond 2014, uh, both in size and ambition. Uh, and the mission, in any case, as you know, to clarify, since I haven't said it today, uh, will be focused solely on uh, counterterrorism and the training and support of Afghan security forces. The, the war uh, ends in this year, at the end of this year, regardless, as the President uh, and NATO decided some time ago. But did the President ask uh, Speaker Boehner, hey, can, can, you, can you please support me on this BSA stuff rather than have Republican members in your caucus making it sound like um, I'm not pushing hard enough to get the BSA signed. Did this come up as a part of the I, I, I don't have a more uh, detailed readout to provide to you. Uh, or, you know, what, I, what I can tell you is that that was a subject of uh, a 
conversation that included many subjects, uh, and that I think Afghanistan, uh, and I think the BSA is part of Afghanistan. That is certainly the focus at uh, at this yeah, time. The, time. the president had just prior to speaking, meeting with Speaker Boehner, had spoken with President Karzai. So this was uh, certainly uh, a a fresh development to to uh, discuss with the speaker. But I'm I, I, I'm not. I, I, maybe I'm missing something. I have, I'm not. Uh, aware of, to any great degree, the uh, critique about pushing for the signing of the BSA, because I think we have been uh, quite aggressive in doing that. And Tommy, on the last question, uh, do, uh, I know you don't have more mm -hmm. to read out than what's in the readout, but um, <coughs> is the Pentagon going to present now the President with a plan that they have not yet presented him with, which is, this is how zero option would work? And when do you expect him to get that I, look, I, look, I think that the answer to that question is, uh, I don't have a specific date for you. I, the fact is, it has always been envisioned uh, by the U.S. and our NATO allies that we would draw down to zero by the end of this year. The prospect of a force beyond 2014 has always been uh, a, a, a goal, a policy goal, dependent upon a BSA being signed. And uh, what I think the conversation today and the, and the message conveyed today by the President to President Karzai was about is the acknowledgement that President Karzai, despite our efforts, has indicated he is unlikely to sign the BSA. And the uh, the consequences of that in terms of planning going forward on, uh, with each passing day, more realistically on the prospect of a full withdrawal and uh, the acknowledgement that we're making today and that the President made to President Karzai that we would be open to the BSA being signed later in the year, but that uh, as time passes, by necessity, because of the complexities of planning uh, withdrawal, and it's not just troops, we're talking about equipment and closing of bases, uh, that uh, the mission beyond 2014, should a BSA be signed, would by necessity, if it happens late in the year, be smaller in scale and ambition. Does that make sense? John. Um, on the meeting with uh, Speaker Boehner in, in the readout that the Speaker's office provided, a mm -hmm. long, long list of topics, droughts, floods, fires, Afghanistan. No mention of long-term budget, entitlements, tax reform. So uh, what I'm wondering, given that and given the fact that uh, the entitlement reforms were taken out of the President's budget or going to be taken out of the President's budget, can we now put the last nail in the coffin of the idea of a grand bargain? I'd say two things. Uh, first of all, the, the list that uh, I've seen uh, from the Speaker's office and the one that I uh, provided more or less off the cuff just now, I don't think represent represents a complete uh, uh, they were banging out grand bargain back there, right? This well, I, I don't think we s suggested uh, that they were or that that was even possible in the time that they met. What remains absolutely the case is that the, the President is ready and willing to negotiate a balanced deficit reduction deal, long-term deficit reduction deal, if Republicans are willing to meet him halfway uh, and are willing to commit to balance. That's what the inclusion of so-called change CPI in his budget last year was about. It was, it was the exception to the rule when it comes to the presentation by presidents of their budgets in that it included uh, not a priority for him but a priority for Republicans uh, because that was uh, an effort to make clear in the presentation of his budget that the offer he had made to the Speaker of the House in negotiations at the end of the previous year was still on the table and that it was a good faith offer and that he believed, based on those negotiations, there was the possibility that Republicans might be willing uh, to meet him halfway uh, in achieving that grand bargain, if you will, or even a mid-sized bargain that was based on a balanced approach to dealing with our deficit challenge, an approach that allowed us, because of the balance, uh, to make sure that uh, we weren't achieving that deficit reduction solely on the backs of the middle class, uh, that we were asking everybody to participate, and uh, that we would be able to make the necessary investments in our economy in uh, innovation and 
job creation that would uh, secure the foundation for growth in the future. So that's a long way of saying the offer, as I said last week, is on the table. Uh, but uh, we have not, despite our, I think, persistent efforts last year, all the meetings and coffees and dinners and, and the like, uh, to try to test the theory that Republicans were willing to have discussions about this, uh, despite those efforts uh, producing uh, nothing out of the Republicans. So whoever's fault it is, uh, <laughs> the, um, has the President come to terms with the likelihood, maybe even certainty, <laughs> that he will leave office <laughs> having been unable to <coughs> achieve an agreement that will even address the long-term challenges facing Social Security and Medicare. That is just something that he no, will have I, left and left that problem for his, uh, his uh, successors to deal with. The President has uh, nearly three years remaining in his term, and he believes that uh, there's enormous opportunity for progress in a range of areas with Congress and through the use of his executive authority, and he would not uh, say that there's no chance of that effort being rewarded with success. Uh, but it requires a willingness by Republicans to uh, compromise, to, to uh, agree to the basic principle that if we're going to uh, tackle our longer-term deficit and debt challenges, that we have to do it in a balanced way. And, you know, you've seen, you've seen kind of the schizophrenia among Republicans on this issue where, uh, you know, they, they criticize the President for taking CPI out when, uh, you know, they refuse to deal, you know, in good faith with a compromise uh, on a compromise uh, negoti a negotiation built around compromise last year when the president explicitly made clear it was on the table and put it in his budget. Uh, you see it where uh, they uh, try to hammer Democrats over uh, savings and entitlements that have been in the Republican budget for three straight years. Uh, it's. It, I, I think it doesn't reflect well on their seriousness when it comes to trying to reach uh, a compromised, bipartisan, long-term deficit reduction plan. I would also say that uh, the President remains hopeful that that can be achieved uh, during his time in office. Uh, he will, regardless, uh, based on projections and based on where we are now, have presided over the steepest deficit reduction since World War II. He will have uh, presided over deficit reduction that brings uh, in, a ten, in the next 10-year window, based on our projections, the deficit to GB, GDP below 2 percent, uh, which is significantly lower than the projections under the uh, much uh, celebrated Simpson-Bowles goal. So, uh, and he will have done that having inherited the largest deficits in history when he took office in January of 2009. And then a quick quickly on Afghanistan. Uh, obviously, th this is a, a big deal. I mean, the frustration of not being able to get the BSA signed enormous consequences if uh, the United States has to pull out every last troop at the end of the year. And yet, the President hasn't had a conversation with President Karzai since July until today. I mean, why, why that level of detachment? With the stakes so high, why did the President go so long without picking up the phone and talking to Karzai and personally urging him to sign this agreement? John, I think it's uh, a preposterous suggestion that when you have prolonged negotiation with the Afghan government that produces the bilateral security agreement, you have the commitment through the loya jirga of the Afghan people to support it. Uh, you have a deadline set by both the U.S. and Afghan government that it should be signed by the end of the year, and you have all of the interlocutors that we have at the, uh, on the U.S. side engaging with the Afghan government, including with the President, on a regular basis, uh, that the uh, message that this needs to be signed was not abundantly clear to President Karzai, we, the decision of President Karzai to indicate that it is unlikely that he'll sign the BSA that his government negotiated is, is obviously his decision, but it's not because we haven't uh, made clear that it ought to be signed. But, I mean, what, what, what do you make people, I mean, it's just, again, you've got many, you've got the Secretary of State, you've got many people raising this issue, but this is the President of the United States. This is a, this is a high stakes uh, situation. and. You know, he decided, obviously, it was important to make the call today. I'm just wondering why not as the deadline approached or as the deadline passed? John, I just think that it has been uh, communicated directly and well, indirectly. And you know how well, no, the president has stood up and said it uh, publicly many times. I, I, I just I, I think it's sort of a preposterous notion that somehow uh, President Karzai until today didn't know that uh, it was absolutely uh, our view that he ought to sign the BSA uh, quickly. Steve. 
White House have any assurances or reason to believe that some or all of the presidential candidates in Afghanistan would sign the BSA if they were elected? I, I don't think we would, given the experience we've had, predict with any great certainty what might happen. I would note that those who cover these issues uh, have reported that candidates have suggested they support it, but uh, we will obviously wait to see what happens. And uh, mindful of the fact that the longer we go without a signed BSA, the, uh, the more likely a zero option becomes, and the more, uh, even if a BSA is signed, uh, the smaller the mission will have to be by necessity in scale and ambition. By ne and by necessity, I mean in the President's view when it comes to the uh, planning involved and, uh, you know, the safety and security of our <coughs> troops, uh, that we, we have to have a sort of sliding scale as the year progresses when it comes to what that post-2014 mission would look like when it, uh, in terms of size and ambition. Peter. If I can, Jan Brewer uh, is expected by the end of this week to weigh in on a controversial measure in her state, SB 1062. We asked you about this yesterday, and you didn't have an official statement then, but this would allow businesses to refuse service to gays and lesbians because of religious beliefs, and we've now heard from the NFL, Apple, both senators from that state. Does the President have any thoughts on this? Well, my uh, suggestion yesterday that it sounded like a pretty intolerant uh, proposed law I think reflects our views. As a practice, we don't generally weigh in on every piece of legislation under consideration in the states, but I think the President's position on equality for LGBT Americans and opportuni opportunity for all is very well known. And he believes that all of us, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity, should be treated fairly and equally uh, with dignity and respect. Uh, and that view would govern uh, our disposition towards a, a, a state law under consideration. Was in Washington, the mm -hmm. President didn't have any exchange with her on this topic. Not that I'm aware of. Uh, President Clinton right now is campaigning in the state of Kentucky for Allison uh, Lundgren Grimes. I'm curious if the President has plans uh, or has spoken to her about plans to come out to Kentucky and on her behalf as well. I don't have any scheduling announcements to make involving the President. In terms of your schedule, later today the President has two OFA events. The DNC is the only uh, major political entity that has not outraised its Republican counterparts. Some Democrats have been critical, complaining that the OFA is diverting funds away from the DNC because you speak on behalf of the mm -hmm. President and it's his schedule. Any thoughts on that complaint? I think you can expect, as you've seen already, the President to be uh, very engaged in an effort to support uh, Democratic candidates and the Democratic Party uh, through the course of this year. And I think that will be seen in the schedule as it uh, is unveiled. Jay, uh, following on what you uh, told Peter about the Arizona law, you said uh, you don't weigh in on every state law. Why then is the Attorney General telling state attorneys general today you do not have to defend uh, laws uh, banning uh, same-sex marriage in individual states? If those laws are onerous, discriminatory, you don't like them, why don't you work to overturn them? Why is the Attorney General telling other attorneys general don't defend the law. Well, two things. The Attorney General was clear that any decision not to defend individual laws must be uh, exceedingly rare, in his quotes, and uh, be based on, quote, firm constitutional grounds. As you know, and I think this uh, goes to the uh, first part of your question, prior to the Supreme Court ruling on DOMA, the President determined that Section 3 of DOMA is unconstitutional and that his administration would uh, no longer def uh, defend equal protection challenges against it in the courts. Uh, so th that's the, the Attorney General's views. So can't individual states decide whether they think it's constitutional or unconstitutional? No, I'm, I'm not aware that, that. The, well, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure that states decide what's constitutional. But Can I ask you about health care? Secretary Sebelius was on HuffPost Live today, was asked about the original goal of 7 million new enrollees by mm -hmm. the end of March. Uh, would you still hit that? And she said, quote, certainly hope so. Uh, so I wonder, um, she wouldn't give a specific number, but she mm -hmm. said, I hope we hit that target. Um, is 7 million still the goal or the 5 million, 6 million goal that the Vice President said? Well, I'd say a couple of things, Ed. I, I think what Secretary Sebelius was uh, reflecting is that we don't have a specific numerical uh, goal in the sense that, ago. well, I, I'm happy to go through 
that again. But the, a, hold on, hold on. Okay. Get through my sentence. Uh, that there's not a specific number that we hit and suddenly it's a success and below that by one or five or 20 and it it's not, doesn't work. The, the, the important factors here are that uh, there's a substantial number of people uh, in the millions who enroll. Uh, we are very confident we will reach that goal. Uh, also important is that there's a good mix uh, demographically who have enrolled and we believe based on the data we've seen thus far and based on the experience that Massachusetts had and the closest thing to a uh, model and precursor to the Affordable Care Act at, at a state level uh, that we will achieve that necessary demographic mix for the exchanges to work uh, effectively. When it comes to the 7 million target that CBO simply said was what they believe based on their analysis we would reach and that it's true other uh, administration officials then said uh, we hoped we would achieve that. I think what the Vice President said uh, reflects our basic view that, you know, we're going to get uh, a lot of folks by the March 31st deadline. You won't hear me or the Secretary or anybody else say it's going to be this number or over that number. Uh, we're confident that the website has been working effectively for the vast majority of the American people who want to avail themselves of it uh, in order to purchase insurance and that uh, the numbers that we've seen uh, put us on track as long as we do our jobs well uh, to uh, achieve the goal of a substantial number in the millions of Americans. Last one. C CMS had a report from the administration the last few days about the impact on small businesses of uh, health care law. Uh, they pointed out that the impact on large companies will be negligible and there will not be, be a huge impact. But on small businesses, they said nearly two-thirds of them will pay more for coverage. Mm -hmm. um, since is the administration saying this, mm -hmm. is that not concerning? Well, of course, the f truth about what the CMS evaluated uh, was one provision or one of three. They, they looked at three provisions within the law, just three, not the rest, and only one of them has a measurable impact on premium. So they didn't look at the whole impact of the law. And on the one provision, uh, they uh, showed uh, the result that you uh, just mentioned, but but this is another example of Republicans cherry picking data to tell half the story about the Affordable but it's an Care Act. Report. Why the wouldn't they look at the whole law? Why well, they, they I think it was an administration report requested and and now highlighted by Republicans. Again, narrowly looking at one provision, which was the requirement that insurance companies uh, no longer, uh, in terms of setting their premiums, you know, uh, advantage seniors over young people and 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 the like. So. The fact is, the net impact, uh, we believe, uh, uh, will be positive, and the report itself clearly states several times that its resor results are incomplete and overstated, only looks at the impact of certain parts of the law, not the law as a whole. Other studies that did look at the impact of the law as a whole found that the impact on premiums would be minimal and the benefits to employers and to workers would be significant. Uh, here are some examples of provisions in the ACA that helped to lower costs. Uh, in other words, I mean, the, the point is they looked at one thing that in isolation would have the effect of uh, raising premiums for some individuals without looking at all the other aspects of the law that would actually uh, produce a downward uh, effect on premiums. Tax credits for small businesses, the medical loss ratio, rate review, more purchasing power, more competition between insurers, all of those elements of the law have the opposite effect. So again, when looked at in whole, which is how we tend to do it, as opposed to those who want to repeal the law or, or sabotage it or under, undermine it. Looked at a whole, we believe uh, that the impact on premiums would be minimal and the benefits to employers and workers would be and will be significant. Bill. You just told Ed that the ACA was achieving a good demographic mix, which runs counter to everything we've heard, skewing older, we understand, and you've got people out there pushing very hard get younger people in it because they're underrepresented. Well, actually, that's a misrepresentation of the facts so far. Where we are in terms of, based on the data that's come out, in terms of uh, uh, young Americans, young people signing up for ACA is consistent with where Massachusetts was, A. Uh, B, consistent with where Massachusetts was. Uh, young people tend to be uh, late, uh, late signers up. They, they tend to come at this very late. And hence, as we telegraphed way in advance, there is an enormous effort aimed at reaching young people uh, to make sure they uh, are aware of all the options available to them, make sure they are aware of the wisdom of having health insurance and aware of the fact that they're not invincible uh, just because they sometimes feel like they are because they're young and 
you know, they don't have the aches and pains that maybe you and I have some days. They, you know, they're going to need health insurance, and, and some of them will need it right away. Uh, so that campaign is underway, but we feel, uh, based on the data that we've seen and has been released, that uh, we are on track to have the demographic mix that we need. Well, people don't have it yet. Well, no, it's February, and the deadline's March 31st. Those are all going to sign up later. I, I think that uh, it is, uh, I, I can say with great confidence, based on an enormous body of evidence when it comes to deadlines of this nature and open enrollment periods for a general population, uh, that people tend to sign up uh, in surges towards the end of uh, uh, open enrollment periods. So that's just a fact. We saw that at the end of December. And that young people in particular are more prone to wait to the last minute. I think uh, you don't have to be a sociologist to know that. You just have to be a parent. I'm Julia, sorry. sorry. Uh, Chairman Camp either has or is about to release uh, his tax program, uh, which, uh, as we've heard, the two brackets, 10 and 25 percent, with the 10 percent surtax mm -hmm. on large earners. Uh, is this something that the White House uh, has seen, is interested in, could get behind? Well, we haven't seen the proposal. Uh, we've certainly seen a couple of news articles about it or reports about it. So I don't have a comment on something we haven't seen. But what I can say is that the President has been clear about his principles. He fought to keep taxes low for 98 percent of Americans. He fought and succeeded in a, making permanent a tax cut for middle class Americans. Uh, he fought and succeeded to return uh, marginal rates for millionaires and billionaires back to what they were under President Clinton. Uh, and he succeeded in doing that. He laid out a corporate tax reform plan that would close loopholes to make our businesses more competitive and use savings through the process of closing loopholes to modernize our infrastructure and invest in what we need to grow. Uh, he will also and will continue to take steps to promote economic security for the middle class and opportunity for all. That's the President's approach. Uh, I don't have a response to a tax proposal that we haven't seen. Alexis. Jay, last year the <coughs> President was uh, sensitive publicly to uh, Speaker Boehner's uh, I guess the pressure on him if the two of them met publicly or were seen publicly. The President actually even joked about it and that he wanted to give the Speaker some running room, on, especially on immigration reform. The fact that the two of them met today, does it signal that the President believes the Speaker is in a stronger place to work together on legislation or that immigration reform is going to have to wait for a new Congress? <laughs> I would say, Alexis, that uh, the President asked for the meeting with the Speaker and was glad to have the meeting with the Speaker. It was a good and constructive meeting in which they discussed a range of topics focused on uh, those areas where uh, here in Washington we either need to take action uh, or where we should take action in order to expand opportunity uh, and reward hard work for middle class Americans. Uh, I don't think, you know, the, the more nuanced analysis of that uh, played into the meeting, it's, it was just a meeting. And I think there's, going to my response to a question earlier, uh, whether it's uh, the Speaker or another Republican leader, there have not been a lack of conversations and meetings. There has not been a lack of conversations and meetings between the President and Republican leaders or senior members of the President's team and Republican leaders uh, that is the cause for our failure to achieve everything we need to achieve here in Washington. I think as many of you in this room have amply documented in your reporting, there has been enormous resistance to compromise, uh, largely in, you know, driven by one faction of one House, uh, of one party in one House of Congress. And, uh, but even when it comes to the so-called grand bargain that John was acting, acting, acting about earlier, I mean, the President, you know, we spent a lot of time meeting with Republican senators, so not even in the House, but Republican senators that we and you uh, had hoped would be open to taking a compromise approach. Uh, and all those efforts uh, resulted in not a single proposal from Republicans. So uh, the President's good faith proposal remains on the table uh, on that broader issue. And meanwhile, we're just going to continue to work with Congress to get the things done that we can get done. And when Congress won't, or where the President has unique powers or authority to advance an agenda uh, using uh, his pen or his phone, he's going to do that. I just want to ask you, in all seriousness, when you say it was just a meeting, 
but you also say it was a very useful conversation. What was particularly useful about the two of them meeting face to face? Alexis, I, you know, I, I would simply say that two things, as I noted earlier, we don't read out uh, every meeting and conversation that the president has, uh, and two, uh, this particular meeting was good and constructive, and it, as I think both sides have said, covered a range of topics. Who else was in the meeting? Where did they get together? Uh, I believe Katie Byrne Fallon, our uh, legislative affairs director, was in the meeting. I'm not sure if anybody else was, but we can we'll we'll get that for you. In the oval. In the oval, yeah. Jay. Juliet. Jay, a couple questions on the demographics for young people. I just wanted to get a sense. So right now, according to the most recent stats, I think we stand around 27 percent of the enrollees. Mm -hmm. General experts have talked about needing 40 percent of enrollees to be young people. Could you just uh, define success? No, I success? think that the general experts have said that 40 percent of people who are uninsured are young people. That's a little different from what you would need for the exchanges to uh, have the demographic mix that's necessary for them to function effectively. Wait, so so if, you look, the, if you look at the Massachusetts experience, the yeah. fact that 27 percent, as you identify, is roughly where we are now, that is entirely consistent uh, where, uh, with where Massachusetts was. Uh, and we remain... At the end of the process or at this point? At this process? point in the process. And, and we remain uh, hopeful and optimistic that, not least because of the efforts that are being undertaken to reach out to folks around the country, that come March 31st, we will have uh, a demographic mix that will uh, meet the criteria necessary to have effective exchanges. And then on wildfires, I was just wondering, mm -hmm. given that you have a new budgetary proposal and that came up with the meeting with the speaker, can you describe to what extent he seemed open to that proposal, which obviously would require action by Congress? I, I wouldn't characterize on behalf of the speaker his views. I, I would simply concur that it came up uh, in the meeting. I laid out in some detail yesterday uh, in the briefing what the President's approach is, uh, essentially acknowledging that these severe wildfires are, uh, you know, ex create extraordinary emergencies and that uh, we have been in funding suppression efforts, basically, uh, you know, stealing from one fund and in order to deal with suppression and therefore leaving us short in a fund that is meant towards, you know, to provide mitigation efforts. So uh, because of that, the President's taking the approach that he's taking. Yes, Peter. Uh, back on Afghanistan and the call today, to what extent was it timed to uh, allow uh, Defense Secretary Hagel to put the zero option more fully on the table when he meets with uh, his fellow NATO uh, colleagues in, in Brussels? Well, I, I think part of that sentence uh, reflects the timing. There, one of the reasons for the call early this week is because Secretary Hagel will be participating in the NATO Defense Ministerial later this week uh, and obviously planning for a potential uh, post-2014 force is something that will be on the agenda at that uh, NATO Defense Ministerial. So uh, that relates to the timing. Again, the, the prospect of no troops beyond uh, the end of this year has been on the table in the sense that for these past weeks President Karzai has been indicating that he's unlikely to sign the BSA and absent a signed BSA, you know, we cannot and will not have U.S. or NATO troops in Afghanistan and the longer we go without the BSA being signed, the more uh, real that prospect becomes. The planning for that contingency is underway uh, and I think that was the one of the messages the President sought to convey today to President Karzai. Did he also send him a message about uh, U.S. aid, the future of U.S. aid being contingent on signing a, a BSA, if some in Congress have demanded uh, it? We, we gave a fairly strong readout uh, and full readout of the call. Uh, I think that we've made clear that our commitment to Afghanistan, uh, separate from a potential troop presence beyond 2014, uh, is in our national security interests and, uh, you know, continues. But I, so I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have anything further as relates to uh, non-military aid or, you know, funding that isn't related to a military presence. John Christopher. Jay, what does this 
White House anxiety level when it comes to the next move that President Putin may take regarding Ukraine? John Christopher, our, our views on this remain what they have been, which is that we strongly believe that it is in both Russia's and Europe's interest that there be a de-escalation of violence in Ukraine, uh, that there be stability restored in Ukraine, that there be uh, steps taken to establish a unity government, a multi-party government, a, a technocratic government that reflects all sectors of Ukrainian society, and that there be early elections, uh, which would allow the country to have a government that broadly reflects the will of the Ukrainian people. In the meantime, obviously, decisions need to be made uh, to ensure that uh, the economic piece of that stability is achieved. Uh, and, you know, we are, as I said yesterday, uh, working with our partners and you know, allies uh, to look at ways that we could complement a potential IMF uh, effort uh, along those lines. When it comes to Russia, as I said, uh, we don't view this as a a binary proposition. The fact is, Ukrainians have expressed very uh, clearly over the past weeks and months that they desire uh, greater integration with Europe. And if that is what they desire, no other entity should deny them that opportunity. No state or other entity should deny them that opportunity. But it is not a contradiction to say that Ukraine can achieve that further integration with Europe that the Ukrainian people des to desire while still maintaining close, historic, and cultural and economic ties to Russia. Uh, we believe both are possible and both reflect uh, Ukraine's history and uh, the desires today of Ukraine's people. Okay, as you know, you spent a lot of time in this region. Um, the, the Ukrainian people are not solidified on exactly which way they want to go. So wh where does the White House? Well, I'm not sure. There's the, there's if, the if east and there's the west. Concept. Sure. I would say a couple of things. One, we strongly believe uh, and, and, and believe that Europe and Ukraine and uh, Russia uh, should or ought, you know, do or ought to share the view that uh, Ukraine's uh, independence, and territorial integrity, and unity needs to be preserved. Uh, I would note that in the actions taken by Parliament uh, in the last several days, uh, the substantial majorities have included votes from parliamentarians of President Yanukovych's party. And uh, that's not an insignificant development. So what is important going forward is that Ukraine uh, takes steps both in the establishment of a technocratic unity government and then through the process of free and fair elections uh, that ensure that the government of Ukraine in the future reflects the will of all the Ukrainian people and allows for the voices of all the people of Ukraine to be heard. Thank you. Uh, Jessica. Uh, the State Department confirmed that the United States has expelled three Venezuelan diplomats uh, from the embassy here. But President Maduro says he plans to nominate a new ambassador to Washington and improve the American perception of him. Does the White House welcome that, especially given the enormous oil trade relationship? And of course, with all the protests there, does the U.S. want a relationship? Well, I'd say, a, I appreciate the question. I'd say a couple of things. One, the United States did declare three Venezuelan uh, diplomats PNG yesterday evening. That was a reciprocal move. This action was taken, uh, as I said, based on reciprocity, reciprocity for the February 17 expulsion of three U.S. consular officials from Venezuela. On the broader matter, I would simply say that President Maduro needs to focus on addressing the legitimate grievances of the Venezuelan people through meaningful dialogue with them, uh, not through dialogue with the United States. Despite what the Venezuelan government would like to lead people to believe, this is not a U.S.-Venezuela issue. It is an issue between Venezuela and its people. We've been clear all along that the future of Venezuela is for the Venezuelan people to decide. And we have indicated our readiness to develop a more constructive relationship with Venezuela. As we said many months ago, uh, that could include an exchange of ambassadors. 
Venezuela, however, needs to show seriousness for us to be able to move forward. Recent actions, including expelling three of our diplomats, continue to make that difficult. Uh, so I think the issues right now for uh, the Venezuelan government uh, have to do with establishing a dialogue with the Venezuelan people. This is not a U.S.-Venezuelan issue. Uh, I'll do the last one. Dan, did you have any? Yeah, on uh, Iran, I just want to ask you about a couple statements by Netanyahu uh, before the Merkel visit and during the Merkel visit. For it, uh, he said again, he said this before, that he believes Iran is set out to become a threshold power with continuing enrichment capabilities. And uh, today, I believe, he said that um, uh, he's spoken to all, all Middle East leaders he's spoken to agreed that it was a mistake to go on the course that the P5 plus 1 have gone on. Does the U.S. disagree with that, that Middle East leaders uh, think it was a mistake? Has there been any headway in um, wanting some of the concerns that the Gulf and Saudis have, the Saudi Arabia trip coming up? Uh, I, I hadn't taken a survey of Middle East opinion or the opinion of all Middle Eastern leaders. I would say that, first, uh, the joint plan of action is an interim agreement reached by the P5 plus 1 that commits Iran to uh, freeze or roll back aspects of its program that allows over a six-month period for the uh, negotiations towards a comprehensive solution to take place. Getting that comprehensive solution will surely be difficult, and it is far from a guarantee, but it is absolutely the right thing to do, especially given the commitments Iran uh, had to make as part of the joint plan of action to test whether or not Iran is now ready to uh, get right with the international community, comply with the United Nations Security Council resolutions, and take steps to, uh, in a transparent and verifiable way, make clear to the world that it is not pursuing a nuclear weapon. Uh, our bottom line proposal, our position is that Iran cannot have, cannot acquire a nuclear weapon. So. The best way to achieve that for the long term is for Iran itself to give up the effort. But the President takes no options off the table. Uh, he simply believes that uh, given the commitments Iran has made uh, and the enforcement mechanisms and verification mechanisms in place, uh, that we need to test whether or not a comprehensive solution is possible, because obviously achieving a nuclear weapon-free Iran through uh, a diplomatic agreement that is verifiable and transparent is uh, a far better outcome uh, than alternatives. Thanks, all. Thank you.